Welcome, everybody. Um, so I plan to speak for about an hour, and I have several things that are like a mosaic. Each section has so much more to explore and um, investigate if you're interested in it, but I want to give you broad brush strokes so that you walk away from this evening with a feeling that there's real meaning in the reason why we do things here at the Waldorf School because Rudolf Steiner cared a great deal about the future of human life on the earth and he created this this method uh, as a way of um, always keeping the possibilities open for all of us. Um, I have here a, a picture of Rudolf Steiner. He was an Austrian and he was born, as it says here, in 1861 and died in 1925. He was alive during the time of the First World War and it grieved him greatly. So he, um, after the First World War, he founded the first Waldorf school with the, the hope of creating hope for humans for the future by educating human beings so that maybe there's a possibility that there would be no war in the future. Um, but his ideas about education really, he started talking about it in 1907. And just a little bit about him. Um, he was trained as a scientist. He went to technical college. Um, they call is kind of like our polytechnic school and he then um, studied philosophy for many years out of his own interest and became a great scholar of Goethe and after he graduated university he was invited to be the editor of the, the Goethe uh, annual sort of um, magazine that came out and was the manager of the Goethe archives in, um, in Austria, Vienna. And while he was there, he mixed and mingled in the, the groups with all of the sort of dilettantes, uh, um, they, the, the intellectuals. Even though he didn't have a university degree, he had great thoughts. One of the special things about Rudolf Steiner was that he had a, a connection to the spiritual world. He was a seer, clairvoyant. He was also a scientist. So he was able to speak about the spiritual world in a way that a scientist would talk about the, sen the sensible world, the world that we see with our senses. And he could foretell that the, the future would bring mankind to depending only on what they could see and hear and sense. And he wanted to create a schooling for anyone who was interested to develop their abilities to recognize, understand, and know the things that are super sensible, that are above our senses, that are not seen or heard, but can be felt and known and understood. Um, so he created through his work, his lecturing, his conversations, um, a, sorry, I forgot to turn this on, let me turn this on. So he, he started a path um, and spoke to his listeners about uh, a new way of thinking, training your thinking through uh, practice, observation of yourself, and trying new things in the way that you think through meditation um, and exercises that he outlays in many of his books that are freely available to anyone who's interested. He called this study Anthroposophy. I'll write it here so you can see. big word. So anth anthro and sophie. So we have the human being 
and wisdom. So it is a way f- both. It's had several sort of ways of looking at what this word means. It's, it's the, the wisdom of mankind. It's also the wisdom that allows mankind or the path that allows mankind to understand the wisdom of the world. For we are um, developing constantly, human beings over time, with every era and every eon, human beings develop and their um, ability to know themselves and their community and their history and their own development expands with every year and every opportunity to look to the past, see where we've been, how your thinking changes. So the path that he did, that he spoke about, he would lecture for many, many, many years during this, um, m- most of his life. Around 1902 was the first time that he started publicly lecturing about his thoughts and ideas about the spiritual world and its relationship to human life on the earth. Um, until his death, his last lecture was just days before he passed away. And he talked about the wisdom of human life, about our place on this earth, why are we here, and what is it that we can do together. He talked about the arts, drama, painting, architecture. He developed eurythmy, which our students here uh, do on a weekly, daily basis. He invented, you might say, biodynamic agriculture, which many of you may know. Um, There are several farms where people get food, and what that is is it allows the farmer to recognize that the farm itself is a being. The farmer is one aspect of the farm, and the animals are an, play an important part, and the plants play an important part, and the spiritual beings that support the growth of the plants and the animals are also part of the farm. And as uh, the farmer awakens to those connections, his connection and ability to work on the farm grow. And then he talked about therapy and medicine, and how we as we develop new abilities, um, we can help people get well in a very different way than the more allopathic methods that were popular at that time. And education. So he came to this new way of talking about the human being and how we develop over time, uh, both in our uh, cultural ages So people who lived during the Greek time and the Roman time are very different people than the people who live in the Renaissance time and even just in the 1800s and how we live today. But essentially the human being itself is the same. We're just evolving, becoming more and more as we go along. So the path of training is to develop capacities that make us truly human so that we open up to what our destiny is here on Earth. Why are we here on Earth? This is the one thing that brought me mostly to anthroposophy and studying Rudolf Steiner's work is because I always, from when I was a small child, questioned, why am I here? Not like, why am I here living in this house with this family, but why am I a human being on this Earth, and what am I supposed to be doing while I'm here? So Steiner speaks about the destiny of the human being is we are here to develop love and freedom. And those are big words and they're defined in so many different ways by different people. But that that is part of our task is really to understand what is freedom? What does that mean? How do we represent that in our daily life? And what is love? He's not talking just about the love of the heart, but he's talking about the love of the action, going out and doing deeds of love. So when he started talking about educating the human being, he, he in this very first lecture in 1907, he talked very deeply about 
what is the human being? So here I have this is my my picture, sort of a picture representation of what he calls the four bodies of the human being. So the first for my fourth grade parents, this is familiar because I talk about this all the time. Um, there are four bodies. The first one I'll start with is um, the brown one, which is really solid. This is our physical body. So when he begins from the moment he starts talking about educating the human being, we need to know essentially what is the human being. If you look at a child, what is standing in front of you? You look at me as a teacher, and who am I as a human being, and how am I similar to the child that's standing next to me? So we all are born with a physical body. That physical body is born at birth from the mother. It's our part that we see if we were to separate just the physical body from the rest of ourselves, you would get the biggest feeling of it when you look at a dead body in a, in a coffin. That's the physical body. All the rest of that human being is departed. The second part, well, this, this physical body is all our mineral bits. All what is earth is in us. We talk about Genesis where man was molded from the mud of the earth. And then life was breathed into him. So Steiner talks about this life that was breathed into him. We, we call it the etheric body in anthroposophy. Or uh, some people in Chinese medicine, they call it the qi or the life. So this is the etheric. And here I have it sort of commingled with the brown. It's, that's how it is in our body. It's commingled. The earth and the life, they live together. It's the vital force, the form that brings life to the mineral aspects. It has a rhythm. It helps us to grow, reproduce, and causes the inner movement of our fluids in our body. A etheric body helps the blood flow, helps the lymph transform. There's uh, that force, that moving force that helps us. It is in its state equally the same size as the body, the physical body. So it doesn't stick out in any way. You can have a real sense of the etheric body if you sit quietly in meditation and you just ask yourself, how do I feel today? What's my liveliness? Many people also say it has a similar aspect to our immune system. When you're not feeling well, it's actually your etheric body telling you your more conscious self, that something's not quite right, not, not health-filled, something's not flowing right. The next aspect is this big pink section, which um, different people call it different things. Um, Steiner called it the astral body. I like to call it the sentient body because it's the part of us that makes us feel. Um, the physical body we share with the minerals. So if you look at a mineral, that's the physical part of us, is a mineral part. Etheric body, we're very similar to a plant because a plant has a physical body and it has this rhythmical flow of water and growth and reproduction. The astral body links us to the animal kingdom because it also helps us with our in impulses, our cravings, our desires, pleasure and pain. 
I drew it as this nice big bubble because some people call it the aura. And you can feel someone's astral body as they enter the room. You get close to them. There's sort of a, a, a feeling of electricity. You know, you, when you get close to someone, your astral bodies intermingle. That draw or uh, uh, antipathy or sympathy that you have with someone that is helped through the relationship of sensing someone's astral body. And the last aspect that is um, what Steiner feels is the most unique to the human being is the ego. Um, ego has so many um, different connotations from psychology that we have today, so I like to call it the I. This is m me, my, my individuality, who I am. And this part of us is the part that connects us to the starry world. This is our God part. It is the part of us that makes us unique and different from anybody else in the world. All these other parts everyone else has, they're of different levels of health and size and shape, but they're all basically the same. And it's our I that enters in. There's lots of chairs here in the front if you, if you like. This I enters in and it takes hold of these other parts and makes us the unique individual that we are. I have it a little bit in the heart because the heart will eventually become an organ of thinking. It isn't right now, but thinking of giving us, propelling us towards our future, which is brought to us by our I. We, Steiner speaks a great deal about reincarnation and karma, which I won't speak a lot about today, but we recognize that this is the part of us that comes back each time. And the sheath that we create for ourselves in each uh, incarnation is different based on what we need to learn in that lifetime. But this part remains the same, and it gets carried on to the next life. It also has a, a strong connection to the frontal lobe of our brain, which is very different from what the animals have. It helps us with language and processing our experiences so that we learn and do things differently as we get older. <coughs> the ego is most connected to no other being on this earth. We as a human being are the only ones on this earth that have an ego. The angels, who are the next level above us, they have an ego, but they have relinquished the physical body. But we won't go too deeply into that. We have to talk about other things. So here's a chart here. Just reiterating what I've said. Physical body is the vehicle that carries us around, giving us the ability to live on the earth. Makes us visible, here, present gives us weight. Etheric body helps us grow, gives us a memory and the ability to reproduce. And the astral body or sentient body creates our inner life. It helps us to know who we are inside ourselves, our feelings, desires, impulse cravings, pain and pleasure. Now the great thing about what the eye then does, the eye has a special purpose because it has this God within and our development that happens over time, we have tasks to accomplish. And what we have here is in many ways what we've received from our family and our upbringing. So there's kind of this nurture nature thing that we all talk about. So this is nature. <coughs> There's a, an overcoming of what we've been given by our parents. 
that comes around middle childhood. And this then comes as a result of those experiences. This is our individuality. This is the part of us that can help us change and become something new. So what Steiner says and speaks a great deal about is how this I works out of itself on these other parts. And as we develop, we can become different. So this sentient body, which is desires, impulses, and cravings, when the eye starts to really work on that, we have purified sensations. Purified. Things aren't so earthly. They're not so, they're just not so driven. There's empathy. A child can't have empathy on its own. It can be modeled empathy and can imitate empathy, but it, he or she will not actually have their own empathy, a deep feeling of empathy until the eye works on these things and that is then transformed into these new things. The etheric body, which is all of these things, is also about our daily rhythms, our HY, can be transformed through the working of the eye into Permanent intent for life. Setting goals. Following through with a goal. Because it takes repetitive efforts over time to do something new. It needs this a healthy etheric body with the help of the I to be able to do this. Goals, goal setting, following through with a goal, and strong memory. We, we think about all of the memory issues that adults are having nowadays, and I just question, what happened in this development here that when it comes time for them to have good memory, it is, it's not successful. There isn't the, the capacity for that, or it deteriorates. So it's just a question that I have. Here is conscience. A child can't have conscience until his eye or her eye comes on board and can take experiences and build. They can mimic or imitate conscience, but they really won't have their own inner conscience until later. And then eventually, this eye, if working in the right way, in the very distant future, the eye the individuality can actually come in and make choices about what their body looks like and how their body works. They, right now we're so asleep to the way our heart beats, the way our digestion works, the way our blood flows. And Steiner speaks about how the eye will eventually take over the physical body and we will beat our own heart. We will digest, we will actually be in charge of digesting our food. And it will be a conscious activity for us. What our, what we were, what we are asleep to now will become awakened as the eye works deeper and deeper into the body. He says that 
our body will become more refined, more efficient, illness can be overcome more quickly, and the, the lightness in the body will also shine out. We have this God-like part of ourselves, and we can shine it out into the world and affect the world as a result of that. So self-education, he says, is the first part. We must be able to learn and develop these higher ideals and perceptions, transforming our habits, character, and eventually deeply altering our human form. So this is like, oh. how do we get there? Who knows? This Steiner talks about it one step at a time. One step at a time. So this, this I'm quoting from this lecture that I've been speaking about. I'll hold up the book in a moment. He says, life in its wholeness is like a plant. The plant contains not only what it offers to external life at that moment, but it also holds a future state within its hidden depths. Likewise, the whole of human life also contains within it the seeds of its own future. But if we are to tell anything about this future, we must first penetrate into the hidden nature of the human being. So, using the plant as an idea, I just want to now step into this picture of the, the threefold human being, which is what we advertised. Steiner speaks about how when the child first enters into the world, their seed, this little baby that you hold, there's, you see the possibilities of its future. You know that it's coming with these wonderful desires and, and wishes. You have wishes. The angels have wishes for this child to develop and, and grow into itself. So here is this little seed that arrives. And the first thing it likes to do is spend its time putting its feet on the ground. Develop the physical body. Now, when the child was in the mother's womb, you couldn't ask the physical body to do anything. It was protected by the mother. The mother created this uh, warm space for the child to gain its mobility, to gain its somewhat of an individuality. To bring the spiritual being of the child, it creates this vessel for the child to incarnate into. And they then come to the earth, and their first job is to grow roots. They need to stand, talk, and call themselves it's a lot of work. Can you imagine? I mean, you all have children. You watched it happen. To be like this, to find their way to stand up, which is probably the most incredible thing ever, and then to actually be able to communicate their inner life to the outer world. These roots then have to develop so that they can move freely out in the world. Their language has to develop. They have small motor skills and they have big motor skills. They have to know what their place is in the world. So, this is a time of willing. The first aspect of the soul that we try very hard in Waldorf education to focus on. The child wants to feel they have a place in the world, and we as their educators want to make them feel able. And I'm going to now hand out this little piece of paper so that you can you can look. You can look at this while I'm talking. 
you'll see that there, if you flip it over so that you see my drawing. They want, the child wants to be able to do things. But there also is this aspect of play, pleasure. They want to be delighted by the world. They've waited many, many, many years in the starry lands, and here they are finally on this earth, and we want to build this vessel, this vehicle for their self, and we give them from age birth, to age seven to do this work. Let's make this vessel for your soul, for your spirit, for who you are, your individually, individuality. Make it as strong and capable as possible. And Steiner suggests that's all you focus on. Because this part, the etheric body, has a job to do. In the same way that when the baby was in the mother and the physical body was shrouded by the, by the mother's body, the physical body was working to develop itself. So that at a certain point when it was born, the physical body was then free to move. The next higher aspect, once the physical body is free, is now working on the inside of the physical body. Developing the organs, developing the brain, developing the way the blood flows, developing the heart, developing the digestion. Let it do its job and let's focus just on the physical body so that the child can do and be and travel and be active and engaged in the world. Steiner talks about how that child then, you know, flip this around. We teach through imitation. Child up to age six and a half, do as I do. You watch children walk down the street and daddy and child walk the same. They have the same way of speaking. They have the same habits. They, they want to be like you. That is born in them. That is how they survive, by being like you. So in the early childhood, that's how we teach. This is how you are educated. Teacher does, child follows. Teacher doesn't teach. Teacher guides, teacher shepherds, or teacher leads, and the little chickies follow. There isn't thou shalt not do this or that. There is no, if you do this, I'll do that, or this will happen to you. There is no choice. There aren't all these questions. Would you like this or that? Do you want to go here or there? Would you like dinner? Would you like, would you like chicken, pork chops, spaghetti, chicken fingers? What would you like for dinner? There's none of that. <coughs> For the health of the child, we want the physical body to be healthy. The child has no ability to know what is healthy. Mom knows. Dad knows. This is good for you. We eat this. This is what we eat. And there aren't choices. When we're in school, there aren't choices. This child doesn't get to go outside, and this child not go outside because he doesn't feel like it. We all go outside. We all play together. We all work together. Now, of course, there are 
circumstances where you can't just have your little, all your geese walking behind you, your little ducklings, but that also reflects on how the child has been raised in their home. So that's a lot of what the early childhood education talks about is how can you build a home with a rhythm because we work also with imagination and with rhythm. This drop won't work. With rhythm. Every day, as much as possible, make life the same so the child knows what to expect. Because they don't have the thinking capacities that you have. You all, sitting in this room, have an eye. You've already received that aspect of yourself. That aspect comes here, 21. So if we look back here at this one, physical body, we're born between birth and seven. We work on the physical body. It's not until they're seven that this affair body is done working on the organs and changing over everything that the child got from mom and dad through the hereditary and made it themselves. Seven, you ever heard the sayings, every seven years, every cell in your body turns over? Well, there's a great truth to that. When a child is born, it takes them seven years to grow the cells on their own to replace the cells that they received from their parents. We know that it's finished when the most dense aspect of the human being is finally expelled because the children have created their own teeth. So when they get their adult teeth, those are teeth that were made from scratch in their own body. Whereas the other ones came from you that were given to them when they were born. So when the change of teeth comes around, we know that the etheric body, which has its own unique aspects for learning, is now free. It's free. What does that mean? It means it's no longer busy working on creating rhythm in the organs creating memory in the way we make ourselves well again, in the way that we um, digest our food every day. There's a rhythm to that. You work really hard to build rhythm with a very small child. We get up at this time, we eat at this time, we go to sleep at this time, we wake up at this time. Every day is the same. That rhythm is very healthy for the child. Once that rhythm is no longer needed for the inner development of the child, that rhythm can be used for learning. That, that force, that force of growth, memory, music, artistic, all of these aspects that are creating the beauty of the, I mean, I don't know if any of you are doctors or have uh, uh, relatives or doctors or take an interest in the beauty of the internal life of the human body. It's really quite incredible. The wisdom that goes into making all those things work and fit together in such a neat and tidy way. The etheric body's job is to do all of that and put it all in the right place. And so when that force is free, we're then going to educate that force about living out in the world. And so taking an interest in the world is the next aspect. So the etheric body, um, it works on the, the feeling aspect. So here we are going over here again, back to this growth. The willing is the age birth. Let's get the dark chalk here. Birth. To seven. And when the etheric body, just like the plant, it starts to grow. And if you've ever watched a plant grow, the first thing that comes out are these little baby leaves. So that's what we're going to see. When the child first starts learning, 
you're going to say, oh great, you can learn. I'm going to give you an encyclopedia and you can learn everything there is in it. But they're not ready for that. They like to just slowly grow out into the world, taking an interest in the things that are closest to them. Tell me about my house. And tell me about the plants that grow in my garden. Tell me about the weather that happens here. First and second grade, we spend a lot of time talking about fairy tales, but we take walks in nature. We see the world and we take an interest in it. Mathematics is all about what we see and can feel and touch and move ourselves. It's not about anything abstract. It's all about real experience that they can have. And then things are memorized because the teacher does it again and again and again and again and again. And with that rhythm, it builds this habit in the same way it got the blood flowing in the same direction with the child and the digestive system working in the right way. That then becomes the digestion of experience. So these little leaves, as the child grows, we can use that to represent a feeling, the feeling aspect of the soul. The world is interesting, and I'm a part of it, and isn't that exciting? So in this middle time, from 7 to 14, which is the time of the grade school, we teach out of a sense of beauty. And rather than in the early years where we, the teacher teaches with imitation, or the parent teaches through imitation, here, in the second seven-year period, the teacher creates an opportunity for emulation. I will show you, I will tell you about it, and you take it in and see how it feels. What is it like to be a farmer? What is it like to have been a Roman soldier? Pretend that you're Michelangelo. And what are the feelings that you have that would cause you to paint this amazing picture on the ceiling of a church? What does that feel like? So you give them experiences of farming, map making, going out into the world and trying as much as you possibly can, and they try it on. What does it feel like to be a human being who does these things? It divided, because I'm a classroom teacher and I, this is my period of time that I focus on, I spent a little bit of time to talk about these little mini sections of this seven year period. As you can even see that the child develops in how they approach education. Here, in the first, from seven to nine, and nine and a half, they learn mostly through movement. <coughs> Rhythmical activities, circle games, uh, clapping, stomping, um, interactions with their friends and their teachers. It's physical. Here, in this middle period, they can have a real experience of beauty that is pronounced more so than here. They could actually say, wow, that's really beautiful, and feel it and understand what that means in a very deep way. And then between 11 and 14, or 11 and a half and 14, this is the sort of 12-year change that the children go through. And it's this point that their intellect starts to really work. And there they really love to argue in a way that is so much more effective than if they argued with you here. Here they really understand that I can stand up for myself. I have my own ideas. They live in the life of feeling. So as they grow older and older and older, that feeling life becomes a little bit more refined. And you see those plants 
they put out a second leaf is a little bit more interesting to look at. It defines the plant as, an, as it's the qualities of what it is. But it's at this point that we don't ask the child to think abstractly. Everything is related to something that they can experience. It's really hard as a class teacher nowadays when I'm standing in the class and I'm talking about Galileo. And I want to talk about how the sun goes around the earth. Because Galileo, when he stood on the earth, the sun went up and it went down. And then it went up and then it went down. And I'm trying to create a feeling for what that was, is like. And for a young child, they also have that same perception. The sun goes around us. But we as adults want our children to grow up so fast that we often say, oh, but the sun doesn't go around us. The sun is the center, and we're going around it. It's very jarring for them. They will accept what you say because you are their parent, and they're going to imitate you. They're going to emulate you. They're going to regurgitate any fact or piece of information that you give them with such concern and determination, they will store it in their brain and they'll say, this is true because my mom told me, or I read it on the internet. They've missed this. How do they know that the sun is in the middle and the earth goes around it. Their own experience of the earth is this, what we're standing on, playing in the garden, going to the beach and seeing the ocean, going to the forest and seeing these great trees dig their roots deep into the ground. The intellectual ideas are abstract. They don't have any connection to what the children have experienced. I, as a teacher, always want to teach them from something that they already know. So, this next part here that comes, there's a little bud. I want to make their experience as a Waldorf teacher as broad and possible so that they develop all these wonderful branches and reaches out into the world with experience, real, true, honest experience, before we have the bud. The bud brings forth first the little flower, the little flowering of intelligence of individual ability to create ideas and concepts about the world that come from themselves, that are not things that people told them, but that they can form from their own experience. This grows over time to become if allowed its own time to become real thinking. It's not to say that the child doesn't think. I'm not saying that. The children most of the time now are working out of memory. And when you observe your child, spend some time really listening to them and asking this question, is what's coming out of their mouths a unique individual thought? Or is it something that I've said that they remember? It's not really thinking. 
As a child enters here this stage, they're able, they have had enough experience that they begin to make connections. Oh, Miss Beekman, I remember when you taught us about this in third grade. Isn't that the same as what we're talking about now? That makes so much sense. But what about this? And how does that work? That's thinking. Because they're connecting two things. They're having a new idea that helps them to create a three-dimensional context that is reaching out into the world, absorbing and processing in a new way. That's why argument is really important at this point because they're saying, I have my own thoughts. I have my own feelings about things, but there's still the memory of, this is what my family has taught me is true, but have I really experienced it as true? Then comes this last aspect that comes in childhood, this astral birth, this sentient birth, which is puberty the sexual maturity comes and the children then really step into thinking. And they have to make knowledge of the world their own. And they make judgments on their own. The teacher's job is to create opportunities for them to make a judgment. They give them an experience, and then they create opportunity for discussion, making connections, and then, hopefully, there's this aha moment. It's not to say it doesn't happen here. It actually happened to Alexi a couple days ago. I had this aha moment. I actually saw like this shine come out of his head, where it was like, oh, I get it. But those are brief and so exciting because you really feel that those developments are, are really starting. So I haven't studied this very much because this is not my expertise. This is high school and college. The child then, at this time of their life, they seek out experts. They look at you and they say, <laughs> If you know nothing about this, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to go to my mentor, I'm going to go to my advisor, I'm going to talk to my math teacher, I'm going to talk to my science teacher. They know more than you. You and I live in this realm. We're sort of in the realm of generalists. We want to create this feeling life where they reach out into the world and are exposed in all these different ways to all these different things. So let's look at the sheet here. This bottom half, it will take a little bit for you to digest and I ask you please don't feel that you need to take it in today. This for me has been a 15 year assimilation process. So our hour-long conversation is only the beginning of your investigation. But what I've done is I've identified that in this first seven years, the physical body has been born, opened to the world, and is free to grow and learn. So we're learning with the physical body here. Don't use the etheric body in the first seven years. As best as, as possible. It's not perfect, but avoid instruction, abstractions, too many choices or admonitions before the child turns seven. Because what actually happens is these call forth the etheric body and say, I have to be responsible for these other things that I have to learn and figure out and understand. 
And what happens then is the etheric body is not able to do its work on the organs. It's pulled away, pulled to the head, pulled to the thinking, pulled to the mimicry that happens when children are taught to read too early or taught to, taught to read. If a child is drawn to reading naturally, that often has to do with their karma, that they had a meaning in their last life, and reading is something that they love so much that they're right to dive right in. But if they're taught to read or taught to do mathematics before the change of teeth, what we know is that it weakens the organs. It weakens the child's constitution so that in the future, if this is weakened, this can't get big because the plant will fall over. The leaves don't get enough nutrition to be so fruitful and broad. So here is the opportunity for us just to focus on one thing at a time. In the next period of time, we educate the etheric, but we don't, as much as possible, call forth the astral body, which asks, the astral body is really good at making judgments about things. This is good, this is bad. This I can do, this I can't do. This is something that that person does, but I don't do it. This, what other kinds of things? Intellectual conceptions where there's no context. For a child in, the, in this realm here, between 7 and 14, if you're asking them to understand something that has no context, it becomes undigestible in their being. They store it away, and then when something in their experience reminds them of it, they'll spit it out again, but it's not thinking. But the body then is busy just storing all of these things rather than working on the healthy development of the sexual organs. So, I, you know, again, this other question for the spiritual world is, could our education system or the way that we've, we're parenting or that the way children are being raised by bringing forth this teaching too early, is that what could be causing infertility rates or people having their girl, young girls having their periods very early instead of in their appropriate time? So where is the astral body out of whack? because of our asking the young child to do more than they're actually ready to do. But in Waldorf education, we try our best to do what is helpful for the child by not asking the being of this child to do more than they're really able, more than they're really meant to be doing at this time. So the last part is this 14 to 21, is this time when the eye is doing its last bit of work before it comes into the human being and can be used. It's still there, but it's sort of like the baby and the mother. You can't ask the child to walk around while it's still in the mother. So you can't ask the eye to do its job while it's still being formed. And in these last seven years, it's still being formed. So we awaken the ability to make judgments, but we don't, we don't preach our judgment. We, we help them find their own judgments. We don't say one thing and do something else. Be a hypocrite. Children of this age, from 14 to 21, they see through it like glass. And it insults their eye. It deforms their eye, because then they say, oh, well, you're a hypocrite, I'll be a hypocrite. If that's the way you do it, they still learn through imitation. If you're a hypocrite, if you say one thing and you do something else, if, you're, if you use untruth on a regular basis, they're going to imitate you. They're going to do the same thing. So as a parent and as a teacher, 
you are constantly self-educating, self-evaluating. And it's not to say that you have to whip yourself like they did in the, in the Middle Ages, you know, where they self-flagellate and say, but you always are aware. If you're having conflict with a child, oftentimes the child is telling you, I can't do what you're asking me to do because I'm not able. So you might have to stand down and find where you can meet the child at the place where they are. What can they do? How can they feel able and, and uplifted and supported so that they can take the next step in a healthy way on their own? So, I think I've come, what is the time? So I've come to the end at this point. There's lots of things I could go.